It's July 3rd, 1863. James Longstreet is here and he is heartbroken. He's supposed to be ordering his men shortly to go across this field. They'll have one mile to walk out in the open in front of Union artillery. And then when they get closer to that clump of trees, Union infantry. He doesn't want to do this. He is argued against Lee about leaving this area and going finding better higher ground but Lee insists that the enemy is here and the fight is here and so there they will fight. So when George Pickett comes up to Longstreet and asks General shall I advance? Longstreet can't answer him. He just nods his head affirmatively. Pickett responds I shall lead my division forward then. And the long-haired, perfumed general rides off. But for Longstreet, who will be staying here, knows this is not how it's supposed to go. And Pickett's charge isn't going to go the way Lee is hoping. Charge. I am here at Gettysburg National Military Park and this is part two, which is actually just day three of our coverage of the battle at Gettysburg. The three day battle that went from July 1st to 3rd, 1863. But before we get into this final day of battle and then look at Lincoln's Gettysburg address afterwards in November, uh, remember, subscribe hit that subscribe button and that notification button so you're familiar and aware of any time i'm uploading these stories of the civil war or any other videos that i do for any of my other classes so now here we are day three of gettysburg the infamous day of pickett's charge do we need to rewind no because we've already gone through those first two days so let's just jump on into it The first two days of Gettysburg have already been catastrophic for both the Union and Confederate armies. After two days of fighting, the Union has suffered 17,750 casualties, whereas the Confederates are at 12,500. However, those number for the Confederates will more than double by the end of the day of July 3rd. Dang, this is going to be a rough day. In the morning of July 3rd, Robert E. Lee still believes he can secure a major victory at Gettysburg. He thinks that if he has just a major win here on northern soil, the end of a war will be near. The Yankee fighting spirit will be broken. The Confederacy will secure their independence. Yet, for the third day in a row, James Longstreet, Lee's old war horse, is pleading for Lee to leave the field as the Union still has the high ground. Maybe Lee saw Longstreet, more like Nag Street. But General Lee was tired of his war horse's continued objections. Enough of this. The attack would move forward. Lee's plan of attack is simple. To have Richard Yule, who we spoke about on part one, resume his assault on Culp's Hill and take the high ground there. Jeb Stuart, who so far has been absent the entire battle, finally arrived on the evening of July 2nd. Stuart was now ordered to take his cavalry east of Ewell and be ready for a flanking engagement. But Lee's crown jewel of the plan will be a major assault against the Union Center. Lee will start the assault with a massive artillery barrage, followed by three of Longstreet's divisions marching on the Union line. Lee is positive that after two days of fighting, the Union Center must be weak. Unfortunately for Lee, his plans begin to crumble before they even get going. Union forces do not wait for Yule to attack at Culp's Hill, and instead, on the early morning hours of July 3rd, begin to fire on Yule and his corps. 
Yule himself will be shot once more in the leg. Fortunately, this time it was in his new wooden prosthetic leg. For the third day in a row, Colts Hill will remain in Union hands. Lee's plans are failing. Meanwhile, the brilliant ginger Jeb Stewart will be surprised to be engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat as his cavalry was matched up against General Gregg's division and General George Armstrong Custer's brigade. The fighting will include intense saber fighting that will last for hours. When Jeb Stewart realizes there is no way he could assist Pickett in Pickett's assault, he withdrew his men from the field. Lee's plans are failing. 28-year-old Edward Alexander Porter has 163 cannons here, and his job is for Lee is to take these cannons and to hit that Union line right over there because they're going to hit the Union Center. 163 cannons, and for two hours, it is a constant bombardment. It is so loud that over 200 miles away, those folks in Pittsburgh can actually hear this artillery barrage. The goal is to take out the Union guns. Do they? Edward Alexander Porter's two-hour bombardment, however, did not do the job Lee had expected. Porter's objective was to lay waste to the Union Center. However, Colonel Porter's 163 cannons all firing repetitively near the same time, the amount of smoke from the bombardment obstructed the vision of the officer. Porter's Confederate guns are overshooting the Union line and a young artillery colonel does not know his guns are missing their target. Lee's plans are failing. And this brings us back to where we started the story today. General George Pickett with the perfumed long locks rides up to his friend James Longstreet and asks if he should move forward. And the old war horse, Longstreet, cannot even say the word yes. Emotionally, he is overwhelmed, knowing that the assault will fail, and he cannot muster the word. Instead, all Longstreet can do is give an affirmative head nod, and with that, Pickett proudly turns to lead his grand charge. Quick side note, although this is Longstreet's command, the charge actually goes to three of his divisions, George Pickett, Isaac Trimble, and Johnston Pettigrew. These three Confederate generals bring their 15,000 Confederates out from the cover of the trees and begin the one-mile march across a wide open field to the Union Happening! Center. Although math Happening! was my least favorite subject, what? here's an important math problem for you to ponder. To march a mile, it will take around 15 minutes. There are just under 90 Union cannon that can fire around every 15 to 20 seconds. You do the math on that, and you can see this is going to be a catastrophic mistake by Lee. The Union guns will first fire their pounders. Imagine a shot put flying through the air at a high speed velocity. When the Confederates are around a half mile into their march, the Union guns will then begin to fire case shot, firing over Confederates, littering them with shrapnel. And then, slightly over a quarter of a mile left to go, the Union guns will unleash the horrific canister shot, a tin can filled with 48 one-inch iron balls resembling a giant shotgun shell. 90 cannon, every 15 to 20 seconds firing another round for 15 minutes. Do the math. These plans are failing. But what General Lee, one mile over there, isn't able to comprehend. He can't fathom this, that his nearly 15,000 guys who are walking across this field in that wide, all open, no place for cover, is going to be all trying to get to this tree, this angle in this stone fence that is right here and there's the angle where it's going to take it on back this way what lee doesn't know and doesn't comprehend is there is a ton a ton of union artillery just waiting all along this ridge line as well as the union's center defense 
So General Hunt, who is in charge of the Union artillery, is allows good old Edward to fire upon him. What that 28-year-old officer colonel did for the Confederacy did not know he was doing because when you have 163 cannons all firing along there, there's a lot of smoke. And old Edward, well young Edward, didn't realize he was overshooting. He wasn't hitting this area at all right in here, this area known as the angle. So he was overshooting all of the Union artillery. And the Union artillery, they just wait. And after that two hour bombardment, Lee orders his troops to come through those trees this way, and that's when all of these Union artillery all along this line first shoot cannonballs, which are gonna be able to easily hit the Confederates coming out of the trees, walking. And then as they get closer, the Union artillery is then gonna shift to canister, which is like a shotgun shell kind of thing that's going to wreak havoc absolute havoc on the Union lines as they're marching through. And then when they get within about 400 yards, so mm, just a little beyond that fence right there, I, you know, that's when the infantry all lined up here are gonna start firing their rifles. There's not gonna be really any Confederates that make it to the ankle, angle. Some of them do, miraculously but at such great casualties that they, they can't even hold this here. As soon as they get here, they are immediately countered and have to retreat back. And this is where the failure of Pickett's charge ends up. Only Lewis Armistead's Confederate brigade made it to the angle. Armistead led his troops walking in front of them with his hat stabbed through his saber and waving it around like a drum major. He could be heard shouting on the field, Remember what you are fighting for, your homes, your friends, your sweethearts. As nearly as soon as Armistead arrived at the angle and crossed the rock wall, he will be shot twice. Armistead will die of his wounds two days later in the Union Hospital. One of his final requests during his dying days was that his belongings be sent to his dearest lifelong friend, Winfield Scott Hancock. The Union general, who was leading the Union troops, he was specifically attacking at the ankle. Friends, first and foremost, though. General Lee sees the devastation of Pickett's charge. It's 50% casualties. And out of those nearly 15,000 that went to the wall, only about 7,000 of them are coming back just over 7,000. The general, who is extremely beloved by his men, rides out to about this general area and he sees the devastation that his plan, his order, his decision to make this attack has caused onto the Army of Northern Virginia. And he tells the boys that have come to him, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. This, this is all my fault. This is all my fault. But his boys, who absolutely love him, will say, No, sir. No, it's not your fault. We let you down. The carnage of Pickett's charge is shocking. The Confederate casualty rate will be over 50%, and General George Pickett will lose 26 of his 40 officers, including all three of his brigadier generals. My lord, the devastation of this charge. As General Lee gets himself composed after seeing this devastation of his men, he comes across George Pickett once more. And Pickett is actually, you know, heartbroken. Pickett was a part of his charge. He, he has tears in his eyes. And General Lee goes to General Pickett and, and says, General Pickett, gather your division ready for a counterattack. I, I need you to counter you, gather your division. General Pickett. You must gather your division. And with that, General Pickett looked up at General Lee and said, General Lee, I have no division. And that is when the gravity of how catastrophic this fight was for the general. General Lee realizes he has created a humongous error. 
As Longstreet will later write in his memoirs, no 15,000 men who ever lived could have taken that position. Robert E. Lee's plan, it failed. When he returns to Virginia, he will offer his resignation. Jefferson Davis will not accept it. And Lee will continue to lead the Army of Northern Virginia. But the damage is done. Not just on the Army, but it has to also be on General Lee's emotional well-being. Real last quick thought about Longstreet as we're leaving this battle. After the war is over, Lee's old war horse is actually going to be rather vocally critical of Lee and the decisions that he made from Gettysburg and towards the end of the war. This is going to make a number of his Confederate brethren pretty upset at the general. And then when Longstreet joins the Republican Party and supports his former West Point classmate U.S. Grant, well, some more Confederates are not going to be happy with this long bearded general. I'm standing here in front of the statue of General George Gordon Meade. The Union general, with his eye on this statue right across the field on General Lee, uh, the Union general responsible for this fishhook defense here at Gettysburg, uh, in which he's able to take Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Ridge, all the way down to the Round Tops. And this defense is unbreakable by the Confederates. Lee tried. Lee tried. He tried the ends. He tried the center. George Gordon Meade there kept it. And he wins the Battle of Gettysburg. But he's going to be criticized because after Gettysburg is over, he allows Robert E. Lee to sort of lick his wounds and escape back into Virginia. And there's going to be some criticism for that. But Meade's troops had just fought gallantly for three straight days, and he taxed every single one of them. And uh, they were just too tired to move forward. But yet, Meade still gets, gets the heat for this. On July 4th, while Grant was claiming victory at Vicksburg, Lee began his long, slow withdrawal from the field, once more retreating to Virginia. General Meade did not pursue, and President Lincoln pleaded for his newly appointed commander to follow Lee and finish the Virginian off. The President is desperate to end the war and becomes frustrated with Meade for not pursuing the Army of Northern Virginia. Lincoln has become far too familiar with generals failing him in the East. McDowell, McClellan, Pope, McClellan again, Burnside, Hooker, and now is it Meade? Is he doing this? Lincoln's probably beginning to wonder, will he ever find a general that fights? However, before you form an opinion on George Meade, please remember the following. First, Meade had not even been in command for a week. He was still being introduced to his command when Gettysburg began. He had not yet begun to build the proper rapport needed to lead an army, and he was already in the bloodiest battle of the entire Civil War. How could he properly order a follow-up attack if he does not even know the strengths of his own commanders? Second, four of his generals were killed at Gettysburg, with a number of other generals that will be wounded. He's also lost numerous officers. How can you move an army when his generals, colonels, majors, and captains are all casualties? Heck, nearly a third of Meade's entire army was casualties. His force is completely depleted and he's lost so much leadership, yet he is being blamed for not attacking. Finally, Meade has no intelligence of Lee's losses. He knows he's won the battle, but not to what extent. And Meade's been around the army for a bit. He's seen General Lee put a whooping on the Union Army on numerous occasions. And each time, Lee was disadvantaged. What if Lee was creating a ploy with this retreat to get Meade off the high ground? What if Lee was setting up another trap? Lee was brilliant in movements. How can Meade attack when he's not even sure of the strengths of Lee yet? Yes, the war continues because General Meade does not pursue Robert E. Lee. 
But should we throw George Gordon Meade under the bus for not following Lee? Eh, to me, that's debatable. The cost of Gettysburg is difficult to comprehend. The loss will be Lee's most costly mistake and the battle will be the high water mark for the Confederacy. The Union Army will have just over 23,000 casualties, including the death of four generals. General Meade will have lost one-third of his army. Meanwhile, the Army of Northern Virginia will have slightly over 28,000, including five dead generals and a staggering near 40% loss of troops. After three days of intense combat, there will be 51,112 casualties. But when numbers get that large, they almost become unrelatable. What is 51,000? What would 51,000 look like? Well, if you nearly fill up every seat in either Cardinal Stadium or Kroger Field, that's 51,000. That is the 51,000 casualties at Gettysburg. July's hot summer sun is baking the dead. Death permeates the air and the town's 2,000 residents are left with a grim task to bury the dead. Not only do they have to take care of the fallen soldiers, but they also must deal with the near 3,000 dead horses. The widow who gave her home to General Meade to use for his headquarters during the battle will return not only to find her house damaged from the battle, but also with 17 dead horses in her front yard. The elderly woman was too frail to bury the horses and will later claim it took over two years for all the horse flesh to finally rot away. To understand the horrors of the smell of death and decay left at Gettysburg, some of the citizens will become violently ill from the overwhelmingly rancid odors. One Union soldier wrote about the dead at Gettysburg. Some, with faces bloated and blackened beyond recognition, lay with glassy eyes staring up at the blazing summer sun. Others, with faces downward and clenched hands filled with grass or earth, which told of the agony of the last moments. Here a headless trunk, there a severed limb in all the grotesque positions that unbearable pain and the intense suffering contorts the human form, they lay. With the overwhelming dead, a national cemetery at Gettysburg will be developed, and upon its dedication, four months later, the world will witness one of America's most important addresses. President Lincoln had been invited by his friend David Willis to share his thoughts as an additional speaker at the dedication of a cemetery. However, the president, who was notorious for having a gift of gab, struggled with what to say. Therefore, Abe sat at his desk and reread the letters from families that shared stories about the sacrifices made by their husbands, sons, fathers, brothers powerful stories of loss, and the president was overwhelmed with emotion. To honor those, Lincoln knew his address was to remind the nation on why they must continue to fight. Lincoln departed by train on November 18th for Gettysburg, and a popular myth is that while on a train, he wrote the speech at the last minute. But come on, one of the greatest American speeches ever given was a procrastinated last minute writing? What? No, that is the myth of the address. Lincoln had already gone through several drafts before he boarded the train. He simply had yet to finish the speech. So yes, he spent time on the train writing his speech, but it was because he was making revisions while struggling to finish it. On November 19th, over 10,000 people attended the dedication in the small town of Gettysburg, and a keynote address was Edward Everett. Everett, a former politician, was considered one of America's greatest orators. He spoke for two hours about the battle. Two hours. However, when Lincoln took to the stage, 
His speech consisted of just 272 words and took him only two minutes to deliver. The crowd was left speechless. At the time, speeches were considered an art form that took time to deliver. Lincoln did his Gettysburg Address beautifully in two minutes. A photographer had been sent to cover the president's remarks, and I imagine that poor photographer was still rubbing his temple from Everett's two-hour-long declamation, thinking he'd have plenty of time to capture Lincoln. And then, in an instant, Lincoln was finished in two minutes. The only photo of the speech is Lincoln walking off the stage after it was over. Now, there are no vocal recordings of President Lincoln, but numerous of his contemporaries wrote that the president had a high-pitched, squeaky, whistly kind of sounding voice. And for a few, they even shared that it was something rather unpleasant to listen to. Oh, poor Mr. President. Now, if you've been in my class, you know I do bad accents, a, a lot of them, and bad impersonations. They're filled through these little video stories. So here is another one of President Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent. Oh my goodness. If I did this for 272 words, my vocal cords would be shot. Therefore, I am honored to share I have brought in some additional help. So, help, thank you. Let's take it away. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent. A new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation, so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives. That that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather. To be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So why is the Gettysburg Address so important? Lincoln's 272 words honoring those that died is not just a tribute to the fallen. It is not a simple eulogy for the dead. Instead, his 272 words are an inspiring ode to democracy and how our nation, our beautiful nation, is the example of that form of government. When Lincoln shared those who have died here, he is reminding all of us why this form of government is so important, so meaningful, so worth the sacrifice. Lincoln is also very cognitive that the world still sees our government as an experiment. Democracy is not yet approven. Therefore, this horrific war with so many dead must continue. More death will follow, but it must continue because if the Union falls, 
then democracy fails. And European nations under monarchies would be right. Democracy is just an uncontrollable mob, a government that will not last. This is why Lincoln stated, it is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have thus far so nobly carried on. Lincoln is calling on America to keep up the noble fight. President Lincoln's two-minute address is not just for the 10,000 there in attendance. It was not for those fighting in Union Blue. It was not for a united United States. No, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was for something far greater. It was a speech that was to resonate for everyone, from the recently emancipated slave to the farmer in Maine. From the poor Irish immigrant fighting for the Union to the wealthy British Baron. The Gettysburg Address was for the entire world. So let us look at this address from a worldly point of view. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead hum us karan ke prati adhik bhakti rakhte hain jiske liye unhone yahan aakhri ansh tak atut nishta jata hai que nous resolvons fermement ici que ces morts ne soient pas morts en vain dass diese nation unter gott yao te dao zi you de xin sheng que el gobierno pertenece al pueblo pelo pueblo e para el pueblo no se pierda de la tierra. And this is why this address is so important. That our American democracy established that all men are created equal. At a time when the majority of the world, including many in our own nation, did not understand this. Lincoln shined a light on it. Lincoln addressed it. And that democracy was a government of the people, by the people for the people. Therefore, as a nation, we must continue the fight. However, if there is one thing Lincoln got wrong in his address, it would be this. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Mr. President, we still very much note what you said there. A huge thank you to you teachers and faculty at Trinity for being a part of this conclusion by sharing the words so beautifully written by our president, President Abraham Lincoln. This is our conclusion of Gettysburg, the three day battles. We had to make it up into two parts and guys, thank you very much for being a part of this journey. As always, if you have comments or questions, leave them down below and don't forget to subscribe. Guys, as always, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe. I'll see you soon.